everyone. It's so great to be together. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this time that we get to gather and worship you on today, which the scripture is called Lord's Day. Lord, we ask that you sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Open the eyes of our hearts that we may know and understand you. Uh, gift faith to those who do not have it. And for those you have gifted faith to, Lord, may you increase our faith. May we hear your word, Lord, and turn from our sin and repentance and faith and follow after you, Lord. Uh, bless our morning. Uh, be, all of, be with all of us who are here in person and with those that are also here with us online. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Uh, yes, this is me speaking two weeks in a row. So as many of you have asked, so thank you. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, I don't know if you still want to clap, but today's topic is going to be two of our favorites. It's going to be uh, suffering and serving. So, I don't know if you want to take back the clap, or uh, we could go back if you'd like. Uh, if you want to open up your pew Bibles or your phone, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, we'll be in verses 20 through 28. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about suffering and serving. Uh, this story is also found in two other Gospels. It's found in Mark chapter 10 and Luke chapter 18. Uh, there's one uh, difference between all three of those Gospels when they talk about this narrative, and we'll talk about that in verse 20. Um, and one of the Gospels, Luke kind of just uh, skips over it a little bit, and I think that's because Mark and Matthew really hit it home and really focus on it quite a bit. In the timeline of Jesus' life here on earth, this is right before he gets to Bethany, uh, raising of Lazarus, and then right before after that, he goes to Jerusalem. So this is Jesus' journey. He's inching more and more towards Jerusalem. And as we know, once he gets to Jerusalem, uh, that's sort of the pinnacle of what he does, right? He goes into Jerusalem, uh, he suffers, he dies, he resurrects. And so this is on the cusp of him entering Jerusalem and ending his three-year uh, ministry here on earth. So this is Matthew chapter 20, and this is the word of the Lord. I'll go ahead and read it, um, and we'll all read together. Then the mother of Zebedee's son came to Jesus with her sons and, kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? Jesus asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed keep, uh, drink from, the, from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their high officials exercised authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be your uh, first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So as we usually do, we're going to take this passage verse by verse and see what God has for us in it. Uh, starting in verse 20, I'm going to read it again. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, James and John, and kneeling down, asked for a favor. And here's where we find the difference between uh, Matthew's account and Mark's account. And I say the word difference, and I don't use the word contradiction or error, because there are no contradictions in Scripture, and there are no errors in Scripture. But there are sometimes differences. And so this is what Matthew says. Matthew says this, and we just read it in 20, uh, but I want to highlight a few words. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with their sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said. But in Mark, it says this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Then they replied. So the difference here, one account says Mary goes to Jesus with her two sons, James and John. And the other account here in Mark says that James and John go to Jesus. So why the differences? Uh, it's a simple one, but it's one worth talking about, and I thought we would just take a minute or so to sort of talk about those differences. So Matthew and Mark recorded the same event, but focused on different people, right? 
Um, and so basically what happened is likely that all three, James, John, and the mother, all went to Jesus. But Matthew thought it was more important to focus on uh, their mother, who is unnamed. Um, and Mark thought it was more important to focus on the boys. So it was likely they all came together as one group in talking to uh, Jesus in requesting. So they go to him and they ask him, hey, uh, we want something. Give us a favor, right? They're sort of cashing in their favor. They've been with Jesus for about three years now. So they have a, a few favors maybe uh, stored up. And this is their time where they're going to Jesus and they're going to ask him something. And it says, what do you want? Jesus asked. She said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. So here's their request. When Jesus gets to his kingdom, uh, the mother wants James to sit on the right and John to sit on the left or vice versa, but she wants to have them to have a place of prestige, a place of honor. So you got to ask, why would James and John and their mother ask such a thing as sitting on the throne next to Jesus? It's bold, it's sort of presumptuous, and it's also rather courageous, right, to ask such a thing. But if we read in context, we'll know exactly why she was asking and why she was asking right at that moment. In Matthew, what's interesting about the gospel and like a few other synoptic gospels, is it predicts Jesus' death three times in the gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 17, and Matthew chapter 20, which is the chapter that we're covering. But right before our passage or our narrative, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19. Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, which is the key word, on the way he took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day he will be raised to life. Matthew twenty seventeen through 19. The Jews didn't really understand why Jesus needed to be crucified, why he needed to die. They really didn't understand any of those things. But what they did understand was Messiah was going to come and he was going to restore Israel. Um, and in the restoration of Israel, he was going to go and he was going to rule. He was going to take rule away from Rome and he was going to restore Israel to the nation that it once was. So they didn't really understand why he had to die. So all they heard Jesus these three times saying that Jesus had to die, they still didn't really get it. And even in Jesus' confession of him coming in Matthew 16, when he said, hey, I'm about to die, I'm about to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be flogged. In the first prediction of his death in Matthew 16, it says, um, Peter responds and says, never, Lord, you shall never die. And then Jesus turns to him and says, get behind me, Satan. And that's the first account of Jesus' prediction. The second account of his prediction and his death is in Matthew chapter 17. And he goes to his disciples and says, I'm about to die. I'm about to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to get flogged. I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to raise on the third day. And the second prediction, they respond, and it says in Matthew 17, the disciples were filled with grief. And now we have our third prediction, Matthew chapter 20, where Jesus goes to them, goes to them I'm going to die. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be crucified. And then I'm going to raise from the dead. And instead, in this response, um, it says that these disciples asked him, can we sit on the throne next to you? The mother of James and John and James and John themselves surely forgot what Jesus said in the most important part. They forgot about his suffering that, he was, that was surely to take place. He was going to be handed over. He was going to be condemned. He was going to be delivered. He was going to be flogged and crucified and spat on and ridiculed and abandoned. She wanted to skip all that suffering part and go right to glory. But what's also interesting is there's much faith at the same time in her asking, right? She knew and understood Jesus to be the rightful and the true king. So although she understood it, she didn't really get it. And I think a lot of us are like that sometimes too. Like we understand it and we know it, but we only know it in Heart. And this is uh, the mother of James and John going to Jesus, let one sit at the right, let one sit at the left. She didn't really get what was about to happen. And Jesus, being so awesome and gracious, let's look at his response now as we continue in Matthew chapter 20. It says this, You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. 
Jesus responds by gently reminding James and John and their mother that they do not know what they are asking. They know in part what it means, but not in full. And much like our walks, these things we get, but we don't fully understand it. And this is one of those moments with James and John. They don't really get it, but they know it in part. And Jesus responds and he says, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? And the cup in this context, it's not a physical cup, uh, but it's more of an analogy to reference Jesus' suffering that he was going to undergo or to reference God's wrath right? The cup of wrath. In Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39, right after the story, when he's in the garden and he's praying with his disciples and he asks them to stay awake and pray with them and they fall asleep three times, one of Jesus' prayers right before he's about to be betrayed and then crucified is this Jesus' prayer to God the Father. He says this, my father, if possible, may this cup be taken from me, but yet not as I will, but as you will. So this cup right? Can you really drink this cup that I am going to drink is synonymous in relation to Jesus's suffering and persecution that were awaiting him just days from this moment. So the question that Jesus is asking these guys and and in a roundabout way also asking us, can you really participate in the suffering and, and persecution that awaits me, that awaits the follower of Jesus? Can you participate in that suffering and persecution? And James and John, ignorantly, or maybe boldly, or maybe they just wanted what they wanted so bad, they answered, we can. And Jesus says, you will indeed drink from my cup, which is in reference to their life, or what was about to happen to them, persecution and suffering. And this is the account of James, one of the brothers. This says this in James chapter 12. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them, keyword persecute, he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Here you have James, the first apostle, to die for his faith in this way. And in this story, next up was Peter. They then caught Peter and imprisoned him, but he then escaped. So this was the lot that fell on James, was persecution. This was the cup that he had to drink. And then John, now we have the second brother. And this is what it says in Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in the suffering, another key word, and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony. We know from scripture that James died from being beheaded by Herod. And we understand from church tradition that it's likely that John died in isolation at a very, very old age. So indeed, they were able to drink the cup of suffering and persecution only in part and not in full although they did not understand at that moment what it meant. So here's our first point for today. Uh, really happy, really joyful point is persecution and suffering await us. As followers of Jesus, right, we know what awaits us. And the call of the believer in Jesus is wonderful. And there's freedom and there's abundant life and there's hope and there's purpose, right? And those are the things that we like to focus on. And those are the things we like to talk about. But the other reality is it's also marked with the road of persecution and suffering. That's why in the Gospels, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, wide is the road that many find and many follow, but narrow the road and few find it. Because the reality for a Christian is our walk here on earth may be, will be, likely is to be filled with some form of suffering or some form of persecution, right? And we can all relate to that no matter what stage or place we are at. Uh, One of my favorite books, Spiritual Leadership, J. Oswald Sanders, he says this about this passage. He says, no hedging here, no dodging the hard realities. Jesus simply and honestly set forth the cost of serving in his kingdom. The task was magnificent and difficult. Men and women leading in that task must have eyes wide open and hearts willing to follow the master all the way. So here we see uh, suffering and persecution in two ways. Suffering. And I think we all can relate to this in some way, right? Because in this world, things will go awry. We will lose loved ones. Relationship will end. Hearts will be broken. Hearts will be hurting. We all face some sort of suffering. These are natural things as part of our fallen world or even our fallen selves, right? In this life, we will have trouble. We all know that to be true. 
And the second thing is persecution. The life of the Christian is expressed in what? In love for God by standing unwaveringly to God's truth and character, even in the face of opposition, even in the face of difficulty. It's the role and the goal of the Christian to stand firm in truth, and not just any truth, but God's absolute truth that is found in Scripture even if that means the loss of things that are near and that are dear to us. Because our beliefs and what we know to be true, and if we hold to those, we will face persecution in this life. Because the truths of Scripture most times, not all the time, are often contradictory to the truths that culture has out there. So as the follower of Jesus, it's our job to stand in that truth, unwaveringly, obedient, strong, right, and, and holding to that. And why? Because we know God to be good, and we know God's plan to be better than anything that the world offers. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to look at a few passages that sort of talk about persecution and sort of talk about um, suffering. And so here's our first verse in Isaiah chapter 53, and it says this. He, talking about Jesus, was despised and rejected, or talking about Messiah, was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, And familiar with pain, like one from whom uh, people hide their faces, he was despised. And we held him in low esteem. You got to ask the question, why did Jesus face so much suffering and persecution when he was here on earth? Why? Because he held unwaveringly to the truths that God had for him right? It didn't matter what culture said. It didn't matter what people said. It didn't matter what the disciples thought or did. He was going to hold truth to the idea that whatever scripture says and whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to remain obedient even to the point of death. And Jesus did that and died on the cross. Here's another verse in John chapter 15, verse 18 through 20. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. And this is Jesus talking to his disciples. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will do what? They will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. Right? It was no wonder, right? Jesus faced often opposition, people who wanted to trap him, people who wanted to get him, people who wanted to kill him, right? He often faced that. And yet he says, in this life that may happen to you and to me, you will face persecution. Let's go on to Romans chapter 5, verse 3 and 4. Paul says this, not only so, but we also glory in our what? Glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. What does James 1.12 say? Blessed is the man or person who perseveres in the trial. Because having stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him, right? Who persevere, who stand strong, even in the face of opposition. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it says this. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have, and now hear that I still have. So here Jesus, or Paul, is talking to the Philippian church who is facing persecution, and it's interesting. He says, you've been granted not only to believe, but you've been granted the opportunity to suffer for the sake of Christ. And it's so interesting. I think in our culture, we don't ever talk about that anymore, right? Uh, Suffering for the sake of the kingdom, suffering for the sake of the gospel, suffering for the sake of truth, right? Because oftentimes we live in a culture that's really, uh, in a lot of ways, accepting, right, of of whatever. You just want to be on good terms with everyone. But the terms in which we should be good with is the scriptures, And the person that we should aim to please is not just a person, but it's God. In all things that we do, our audience should be for one, and it should be for God and God alone. But yet, that's not always easy, and that's difficult. In the scriptures, we have a whole book committed to uh, God's sovereignty in the midst of suffering, and that book is called the book of Job. We have another book of God's sovereignty despite our life circumstances being brutal, and that's Lamentations. And like Jesus said, uh, asked John and James, can you drink the cup I am going to drink? 
For the Christian and the follower of Jesus, there's no other cup available to us but the cup that our Lord and Savior drank himself. And if the world hated Jesus for standing for the truth and living in truth and holding to these promises, not giving away in our workplaces, not giving way in how we raise our kids, not giving way in our friendships, not giving way in our relationships, not giving way in how we spend our time and how we spend our money and what we use our lives for, and not giving way in any of those things, right? Jesus says, hold on that truth, but also persecution may come because of that. And I think if you're like me, I read these scriptures sometimes and I think, in what ways have I been persecuted? And I think, and it's maybe a funny story, but I think the worst persecution in some ways that I face is um, when people like don't text me back. (laughs) Um, It's like, like I have just certain people that I text all the time, try to invite them to church and it's like no response, right? And sometimes I feel like, okay, maybe I'm bothering them or maybe they don't like me. And it's like, okay, they're just ignoring me because maybe I'm being too Jesus-y or whatever. Um, But it's like this idea of sometimes we just don't understand it. And yet some places around the world right? They face persecution, and it means their very lives. It means everything that they own, their homes, their lives, their children, their family. And why do they face that? For the sake of the gospel and the kingdom. And that's our job as well, to do whatever it takes and to stand in truth despite opposition and drink that cup that our Lord and Savior drank. And we should not be surprised if when we do so, persecution may well very come our way. But what's also interesting is even though persecution is promised and likely in this world, we have a hope beyond this world. So we can endure the hardship and endure the trouble and endure the per- persecution and the suffering because we know our glory is not here and our home is not here. And this place is simply a resting place and in between. This is what it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 and 7. He, God, the Father, Jesus, will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my what? Children. The hope we have is not for this life. It's not for our 80 years. If we're lucky, 100 years, or maybe if we're not lucky, 100 years. This hope is not found in this life or anything that this life can offer. But we suffer and we get persecuted and we stand for truth and we say no to sin and we live in repentance. Why? Because our glory and our hope is beyond this. Romans 8, 18 says this. I consider that our present suffering are not worth the comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that is awaiting us in heaven, in our time, when it's our bell that is rung, when we get to heaven's door, heaven's steps, we will then understand that our suffering is nothing in comparison to what God is, has for us in this next life. Now let's jump back to our text. So they're having this conversation all about this cup, and we're going to reread verse 23, and it says this, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. You got to ask, why were the other disciples indignant? Why were they mad? Why were they frustrated? Why were they jealous? The 10 indignant disciples were not necessarily mad because James and Jesus asked such a thing from Jesus, but they were mad and they were frustrated that they asked him first. They were more mad and frustrated because they wanted the thrones, they wanted the prestige, they wanted the reward. But what about all the things that we've done, right? Why do they get that? Because they were the ones who asked. So they weren't indignant because they were being so selfish. It was likely that they were mad and indignant because the others asked Jesus first. And if Jesus, or if the other disciples asked Jesus the same question, Jesus would then turn around and ask all of those disciples, and he would say, can you also drink the cup that I am going to drink from and be baptized into the baptism I am going to be baptized in? And all of them likely, glibly would say, we can So here you have the 12 disciples in tension. 
They all want to be the greatest. They all want to be the best. They all want to have the place of prestige. And I think as Christians or as people, sometimes we feel the same. Like, I want the best. Like, I don't want others to have it. Like, I want it, right? Because you know that whole saying, like, if, if, uh, if I can't have it, nobody can have it, right? Because it's the idea, like, we want the best things. We want the greatest seat. Like, we want those things, if we're being very honest. We want to be served. When I go home, like, I want to be the point, right? I want to be served. I want others to clean up. I want others to figure it out. I just want to go and be. But yet, Jesus calls for the disciples, and he says this, and as we continue and close our passage in Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, Jesus called all the disciples together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you, 12 disciples. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your what? Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your last. And this is nothing new from what Jesus has said. We know from the scriptures that he himself imitated uh, what it meant to be a servant, what it meant to love people even in difficult times. And one of the commentaries I was reading, uh, he has this quote, which is, I think, a little intense, but I think it was meant for those who were like teaching the scriptures, but I thought it was just like so good. I wanted to read it. And it's this from someone named Vernon McGee, and he says this. My friend, if you are going to sing for the Lord, please don't try to walk over all the other soloists. And you'll never catch me doing that because I can't sing, so (laughs) I'm off that one. If you're trying to be a preacher of the gospel, don't try to push aside every other minister. If you're going to try to be a church officer, don't do it at the expense of someone else. Our Lord makes it very clear that the way to be great and the way to serve him is to take the lowest place. Jesus always pushed the disciples to put others first, to love others, to care for others. And you can't do that unless you put yourself in the place of a servant and humbly come before people and offer, how can I help? What can I do? In what ways can I love you? Taking the place of a servant and in so doing, being great in the kingdom. And this is our second point. Aim to be a self-denying servant. James and John wanted glory without suffering and persecution, but that's not how it goes, right? Aim to be a self-denying servant. And what areas and places in your life can you aim more to be a servant like Christ at home, in your workplace, in your families, with your neighbors? In what ways can you aim more to be a servant and in so revealing who your follower is? right? Because if we all want to be great, we all need to serve. I remember this one time in my early 20s, uh, I was at my church and it was after, uh, I don't even remember what event it was, so, so such a long time ago, but there was like all this like cleaning up that needed to be done. And at that point, like I really just didn't want to clean up. Like I, I'll just be honest, like I didn't want to, I just wanted to leave, I just wanted to be done, like I'm just going to go home. You know, there are so many people there, someone else could clean up. And one of my very close friends, his name was James. And what's so funny is actually I think of this story um, maybe like once a month, which is sort of weird. But anyway, uh, we're all tired and we're all done and this event is over and we're sitting down and we're talking and he just gets up and he says, all right, guys, it's, it's time to get to work. It's time to serve. And he starts like packing up stuff. He starts putting away chairs. He starts putting away tables. And we're like, what is this guy doing? Because now that he's doing it, all of us now have to go and do it. Um, but I'll never forget that. And that always stuck with me. Because he decided, although he was tired and it wasn't good projects and he didn't want to do it, he yet still decided this is a great opportunity to serve. This is a great opportunity to love others and to care for others. And so our jobs as Christians and as followers of Jesus, we should aim to be self-denying servants and follow in the steps of Christ and in so doing become great in the kingdom. And our last point is simply this. Look to Christ, our example, and we close in Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. And Jesus says this, talking about himself. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? Serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. If there are any verses that we should memorize and know in Scripture in our hearts, it's definitely this verse. Jesus didn't come to be served, 
but to serve. If the Lord and creator of our world, Savior and friend, came to serve, then who are we to be in places where we are not serving? It's antithetical to anything that Jesus is talking about. That doesn't mean that you need to serve corporally or upfront all the time, right? But it means in your places and in your spaces, in what ways can we serve? Can we aim more to be like our Savior? Because if Jesus didn't come to be served, why do we sometimes show up to be served? Why do we sometimes show up and to gain all these things and to be fed and to be filled, but yet also not willing to serve and to give and to empty ourselves? And Jesus' call for us, for me, and I hear this loudly, is come and serve. Come empty yourself. Come give. Come do, right? Serve one another. Love one another. Be in each other's spaces like our Lord and Savior. Because if Jesus came to serve, I also better serve. And we, as you know, we have many opportunities to serve here at First Press. And yet, there are also many opportunities for you to serve right at home. There are one way uh, in which I serve that I'm not a huge fan of serving. Uh, Shout out Christy Wilson is probably at home. So as you know, every month uh, they do uh, crafts where they get together and they put these crafts together for kids in the community, or they get to the, give them out. And so uh, sometimes, sometimes the crafts will take like an hour to do, and sometimes they'll take two hours. And every single time she sends out a sign up, like I never really want to sign up, if I'm honest. We're safe space here. Um, but yet I always sign up uh, because I know that it's good for me, because I don't always want to be serving in the things that I feel like I excel in or the things that I feel like I'm gifted in. Like, like I'm not a craft guy. Like I don't like to do that. Uh, Like, it's just not my thing. Like, you know, it's time consuming. I think, oh, I could be doing other things. But then I think, no, my time best spent is serving. And for me personally, I think I can't, if I can't put those little crafts together, then I shouldn't be serving in other ways. If I can't humble myself and do something like that, then I can't be up here and do what I'm doing here. And I think that that's the life and the role of the Christian is to find areas in which we can serve and get connected with each other. Because I love that verse in 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then he served in the ultimate way to give his life as a ransom and a ransom for many. He came and gave the ultimate service in taking our place. Remember what he said, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? That cup was a cup of suffering, persecution, and God's wrath. And when he died on the cross, he took on all of that upon himself, and he served us that we can now have a relationship with Jesus. He restored that broken relationship. He gave us an opportunity to go to the Father. He, he took that place. And so Jesus came not only to be served, but to serve. So greatness is not found in a title. Greatness is not found in prestige. And greatness is not found in a leaving a name after us that people will remember. But greatness, according to Jesus, is found in humbly being like Christ by serving others. And so find your opportunity to serve. Uh, whether it's small or whether it's big or whatever it is, just find it. Uh, and don't open your burden yourself with saying, okay, I need to serve 24-7 every second of the day. This week, just try to find one thing. How can I serve those around me? Just one thing, and then do that thing, and then build on that. But let us be a community of service in which we're giving of ourselves and also receiving those who are going to be serving us. Uh, and that is the role of the church. Let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Lord, I thank you, Lord, that we can come before you. Uh, Lord, help us to stay strong in the face of persecution and suffering in this life. Help us to take the role uh, and the place as a humble servant, Father, as we look towards you uh, who gave your life as a ransom, Lord. And we come before you humbly, and we ask, Lord, that you bless our weeks. Um, And as we prepare for communion, Lord, uh, we ask, Lord, that you bless this time as we uh, focus on you. And in Jesus' name we pray.